Ram Natarajan. Um, in 2019, uh, we started the AI Institute and we were in this uh, Horizon One. And um, our second um, distinguished speaker uh, in our speaker series was Sri Ram Natarajan. Um, and I remember he had a fantastic seminar um, at that time, and I, I expect no less now. Uh, so we are delighted that he was in town and we uh, took that opportunity to bring him to give this seminar. Um, he, um, you, you, you have seen the title of his uh, talk and I won't say much about it, uh, leave, leave time for him to talk about. Uh, just to uh, talk about the significance of what he does. Um, this year, he was the program chair for AAAI. Uh, AAAI is the uh, kind of a major primary AI, general AI conference. Uh, it'll be held uh, later, last week of uh, February, in fact. Um, and um, uh, there are, what, you accepted 2,400 papers? 300, so, yeah. Uh, so something like, so, so it, it's a massive conference. It'll be in Vancouver. So he was a chair for that. He was general chair for some other conference this year. He's um, a retail in chief uh, for front in AI and ML, uh, also a journal and a whole bunch of other things. So senior uh, member of the AAAI and such. Uh, let's, uh, so recognized person, uh, let's uh, hear from him on this very interesting topic. Mm -hmm. uh, we at AI Institute also do a lot of work in uh, healthcare uh, and AI, um, as it has taken a long time for AI to really make uh, impact in this particular vertical. Um, but now it looks like it's going to take off. And it's a good time to hear about it. A uh, lot of growth in this area. So, Shriram, up to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the kind uh, introduction. So, I'm Shriram, faculty at uh, CS Department, UT Dallas. So uh, the thing is, I always say, you know, let's make it as interactive as possible. So feel free to ask questions, uh, at, you know, if you have any uh, questions on the top. I don't have to finish all my slides. I may want to just tell you the big story and then go from there. And purposefully, um, I have structured this talk so that it's at a fairly high level. So you're going to hear everything at really literally at 10,000 feet level. So if you want details, I'll be around. Uh, you can talk to me. I can explain the papers and so on. Okay. So uh, whenever I start this talk, I always want to thank my students because without whom nothing is possible. And now the thing is not moving. So, okay. So uh, thanks to all my students, mainly my PhD students uh, listed here. And uh, we had a, about 20 plus master's students working with us. So thanks to all of them. We have a lab of eight people. I have spot for two more people. Hopefully we'll recruit them in, in fall. Um, so thanks to all our key collaborators and uh, funding agencies uh, that have made this particular talk possible. The ones that I've uh, mentioned here are all people who have worked with me on clinical problems. So uh, so thanks to all of them. We have a couple of DARPA grants. We have a NSF grant that just expired, a couple of Air Force grants, one Ar Army grant, and two R01s, and NIH uh, grants that, that keep this going. So thanks to all of them. So what we do... I. He said four years back, I gave, came and gave a talk. That was I, exactly when I built this uh, slide. Um, that was actually opened with the, the talk here. Um, the way I think about what we do in our uh, lab is that we are inspired by problems from the outer set of hexagons to develop solutions in the inner uh, set of hexagons. So uh, we look at electronic health records. We look at mental health data, postpartum depression, uh, for instance, the classic example. Um, we look at uh, social network data, some some clinical study data, and so on, um, to develop uh, solutions using human-on-the-loop machine learning, probabilistic logic, probabilistic models, reinforcement learning, planning. Um, and uh, nowadays, we are looking at lo a lot of what we call as uh, tractable probabilistic models, things that can answer query efficiently. So um, I mean, when I tell my students, I always say, think of a motivating problem first, and then go for the solution. You might be diluting the constraints of the problem um, so that you know you're, you're, it's solvable, but that's okay. But start with the problem and then go towards the solution, right? So don't abstractly think of the solution. So that's the way we think about our, our lab. And we call ourselves Starling because we work on um, this area called statistical relational learning, essentially building relational, uh, sorry, statistical models on relational data, okay? So um, when, I, when, when I started visualizing this talk, I prepared this talk for my alma mater, Oregon State, 
um, in October. I was their uh, colloquium speaker. And I was thinking about what would be a good topic for me to teach. And because till then, I used to call this as human allied artificial intelligence, um, because I was, my goal was uh, to think of building systems that can seamlessly interact with, learn, learn from, collaborate with. And in some cases, in the last at least three to four years, we have realized we can teach back to the human expert new things that we find, right? So this, this is how I, I, I viewed the uh, human allied AI was that it, it should be a collaborative learning effect. So the thing is that we are not doing adversarial machine learning or and because we work a lot with domain experts, particularly clinicians, they really want the AI system to do well for them. They don't consider that as a competitor or something that will take away their job. So they're not really um, you know, maliciously injecting false knowledge into it. But they could be injecting incorrect knowledge, okay, as you will see as we go, okay? So these are the types of things that we want to. But then upon deeper reflection, um, the, the uh, uh, question of human allied AI twisted a little bit in my head to say, well, it's more like AI is in the loop of a system that is already existing. So we are bringing AI to an existing healthcare system. So the way I think about it is there is a Starling agent, which is the uh, Chester Relational Learning Agent, that sits out in the environment. And then it observes the medical expert taking some decisions, and then you know there are, uh, and then you you uh, uh, take actions, and then you um, the the human experts take actions, but they can explain their actions, and that reasoning from that uh, explanations become an additional knowledge for the learning agent, and then the learning agent makes some recommendations that it can explain, which then goes back to the human. So it's a two-way communication, the way I see it. A classic example I always put myself in this space. Um, I, we, I had a knee injury somewhere, uh, I think in 2015, um, when I was first di diagnosed with diabetes. And we went to the doctor, the doctor asked me a bunch of questions, I answered. At the end of which the doctor said, have you said everything? And I said, uh, yeah. And it turns out that I forgot to tell him that I have diabetes, right? And then I, I mean, I, I, I have the extension, extended version where my wife hit me and so on. But for now, uh, we'll just stop, stop here. And, and then ask this question, okay, now imagine if there was a, uh, uh, learning assistant that sits inside electronic health record because the doctor was going to recommend me high dose steroids right you've heard of this prednisone many of you would have heard, taken it at some point or the other it's this crash course of steroid that starts from seven in a day to and goes down to one a day as you go through an entire week and basically hitting your body with steroids so that you can fight the inflammation and then allow your body to recover so that's the whole point of these steroids but the side effect of this is that they bring your blood sugar up to very dangerous levels and so as, a, as somebody who had diabetes, that's not something that is favored. But on the other hand, if I'm in acute pain, I should be given that. Now, the doctor should be able to explain one of two things. The doctor should be able to say, okay, thank you for letting me know. This guy did not tell me. But here's the thing. He's in acute pain. I want to bring the pain down. I'm going to bump his uh, uh, blood sugar medicine. Or even sometimes people get a short dose of insulin for like a week. So I'll supplement it with insulin. So he'll be okay. Or the doctor could say, thank you. The pain is not that bad. So I'll put them on some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen, Ali, so on and so forth. So they have their options of doing these treatments. But the thing is that the way I envision this, it has to happen in two-way uh, communication because the system has to understand what the doctor is saying and the doctor has to understand what the system is saying. Okay, so that's the key hypothesis here. This has been the focus of the research in my lab for the past 10 15 years was how do we build these systems that can uh, that can talk to the human and and again right the communication part doesn't mean I'm doing NLP okay I'm only interested in figuring out how can I take this knowledge putting it into a machine learning system and putting it back we were used to work with uh, Professor Dan Roth uh, who is at UPenn now um, Martha Palmer and Julia Hakenmeyer for doing the NLP side of things uh, as part of our DARPA program so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you three problems so three case studies that we have concretely worked on in the last ten years to motivate the type of problems that we can do. And we're going to, I'm going to give you the solutions that we have seen in these uh, cases, okay? Again, I'm going to sweep the dirty details under the rug, but understand the devil is always in the details. So if you want the details, uh, feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions and so on. Okay, the first problem is cardiovascular health, okay? And I, I gave this uh, talk 10 years back to, uh, or 12, 11 years back in my interview at uh, in Indiana, and that is when I freshly worked on this problem. So I was really excited about it. I still am excited about it because for a very simple reason. This is a clinical study that started in 1985, okay, across five centers in the U.S., led by Alabama. And so uh, after at least a uh, few years, so then they brought a bunch of people, 5,000 people, between the ages of 80, uh, sorry, between the ages of 18 and 30 in 1985. Then they kept bringing them back, 87, 90, 92, 95, 2005, and 10. 
So what happened was that these people were brought uh, back at regular intervals. And as you can see, the number of things they measured on them kept increasing. They initially only measured uh, things like blood pressure, some uh, genetic information, not everything because they couldn't sequence them back in the day. Uh, there was, uh, they measured some serum, uh, serum, but they didn't have urine tests back then. And, and then the history was expanded to ask more questions. Physical activity, fitness, now they have all these fitness tractors and all that uh, trackers on themselves. So they, they, they do a lot of these interesting things as they uh, go. So the question is, these people are between the ages of 18 and 30, uh, nearly 40 years back. So they'll be around you know, uh, 58 to 70 right now. Many of them are having heart attacks now. So now you can see how valuable this data is because I can look back in the data to predict who is at a high risk of heart attack uh, today. Right? And, and that's great because we can easily identify early, uh, provide them with treatment plans and avoid uh, the uh, side effects, sorry, the, the adverse effects. The second one, which I'm very passionate about uh, since my kid was born because my wife had some pregnancy complications, um, is uh, the, uh, pro the problem of maternal health. And I, I said this in the morning, for a developed country, you mm -hmm. still has a very high uh, chance of adverse pregnancy outcomes. We are having something like 17% adverse pregnancy outcomes. And that's literally one in five women who have some sort of complications are not uh, from pregnancy. So I'm part of this uh, group uh, led by Indiana. So there are three of us. And the, the clinical study is called New Moms to Be. Um, we are looking at nulliparous women, that is women who are uh, pregnant for the first time. And then we are trying to understand which of them would develop one of these uh, uh, conditions. Actually, I don't know the conditions yet. But one of the conditions that I'll explain later, it includes gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, uh, new elevated uh, blood pressure, uh, preterm birth, uh, and in some case, infant death, right? And we want to we want to avoid all of these, right? The NICUs, uh, uh, NICUs in US are, are now full all the time, uh, particularly in the times of COVID, we are getting a lot of these uh, 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 NICUs that are full. How can we reduce the load on all of these? So that's a uh, uh, second problem. The third problem, which is probably the uh, most common one, is electronic health record. We've been working on a bunch of health, uh, uh, health records, all the way from Regent Street's data, which is a IU, uh, Indiana University Medical School. We have health data from Wake Forest. We have electronic health record data from um, um, Marshfield Clinic in Upper Wisconsin. So we worked on a bunch of uh, electronic health record data. And I'll give you the lessons that I've learned from all these data sets as we go, right? So, but then, I think of what is the what are the challenges to human allied artificial intelligence when I'm deploying them in the wild, right? There are first different types and formats of data. The multimodal data becomes extremely important. And multimodal data, once again, immediately people will think of text data and vision. And so we have billions of documents and billions of uh, things. Actually, we don't. Some of these sequences that we get are very, very, very small. Some of the images that we get are very expensive, $800, $800 to get one image. And you have like 30 images that you have to work with. So aligning these with real problems becomes a pro uh, real uh, problem. And then different scales of data, right? Some You get some data on very minute scale from your wearable sensor, but you people go for their blood sugar level every six months sometimes. And so you, you don't get the data at the same scale. And you want to be able to somehow aggregate the information, project them, and put uh, everything together. Um, and then, of course, different frequencies of data streams. Um, I go to the hospital three times a year. Most of you look healthy. You go once in three years, once in four years. So you, you don't have the same number of data about all of us, right? And then as you go down, things become harder. There are different types of noise in measurements uh, and data sensors. I always give this example. When I started at Wake Forest, we were doing hospital re -admitting. And for one patient, we had four data points for one entry. Okay, the entry was that this patient was in uh, ICU and they were given a medicine. The doctor wrote a medicine. The nurse saw the response and gave a slightly different dosage of medicine. But for some very weird reason, she wrote a different dosage that is between what she gave and what the doctor prescribed on the bedside uh, table. And finally, the pharmacy built a completely different medicine because the insurance would not pay for it. Now, how do you denoise it? How do you work with it? It's an extremely important problem. Um, the thing that I think is also important is knowledge changes over time, right? Um, I was telling this in the morning, when COVID started, we all washed our hands like crazy, right? To the point that, you know, we would rip off the skin out of our hands. But nowadays, you know, you just wear a mask, you're okay. So the point is that the knowledge changes over time. 700 years back, people believed the earth was flat, and that changed. And then earth is round. 70 years back, atom was the smallest element. Actually, heck, my science textbook had atom as the smallest element. And two pages later, it said, well, it consists of proton, electron, and neutron. So we great. Now, which is the smallest, right? So the point is that things change over time. 
the, the things that we cannot do are the following three, which is what is the side effect of something that I'm doing today? Right, the whole chaos theory. You make a small change somewhere, something else happens somewhere. How do you measure that? It's very difficult. Partial observability of the world. We are sitting here talking nicely. We don't know if there is a lion or a tiger outside the building waiting to bounce on us when you go out. Simple point, right? So, but we, we operate with it. And most importantly, we don't know the long term effects of any decision making. So, but can you be afraid? No. But you have to still figure out how to take actions. But what do you think is the biggest challenge of all? In my opinion, is this because every student that I want to work with LLMs and deep learning, right? Every student wants to do this. The best algorithm might be completely different. But no, I need a job, so I need to do deep learning. I need to do transformers. I need to do LLMs. No, that's now you have to take horses for courses approach. Not everything, not everything can be solved by one. I'm a big fan of a uh, lot of the rings. Okay, so I'm the premise of lot of the rings is exactly the opposite of the premise of AI. There is no one ring to rule them all, all right? No one method that's gonna do well on every problem that you are throwing out there. If you do that, we are pretending to, um, we, are, we, are, we are constraining ourselves if, to, to get these things to work. So for me, it's horses for courses. Deep learning works great. You ask me where, I would say in images, in, in 3D images, in uh, getting these fMRI images and understanding these functional MRI images to, to segment them, to understand where the, Lesions are, it's, it's fantastic. Deep learning works beautifully on those problems. And then that's where they should be employed. You take a deep learning method and employ it on electronic health record, and I'm not gonna name the name of a famous researcher who published a paper on this. It was like, it literally made us want to vomit because of the fact that the results were all, I want to say, I don't want to say fabricated, but they were fabricated. Because none of it you could reproduce in, in the small electronic health record that you're looking at. So, you know, understand that you have to do horses for courses. So if you want to do LLMs and deep learning, find problems where they work or where you think they will work and use it. Don't, the, the way I think about it is don't use Tar's hammer for nailing on uh, a clock to the wall. Okay, so that's about it. So with that, I'm going to talk about what I think are the three fundamental steps of uh, human allied artificial intelligence. At the core of it, you need an algorithm that is powerful, that is excellent in learning. Uh, you know, it's, it's effective in the sense that you get your guaranteed good performance. It's efficient. It has to have some sort of sample complexity because many of these problems are not uh, are not uh, big problems, right? They're very small problems. Big data, um, back then there was a big talk that I heard, which I adopted was big data, the term itself is incorrect because it's really not big data, but, but really good data that matters, okay? And then generalizable knowledge. Uh, and uh, they, they need to be generalized to unseen populations. And I'll talk about the adverse pregnancy outcomes. Uh, and I'll give you an example of why the generalization fails. But at the same time, they also should be personalized. So here you see the, the, the duality here. We want this to generalize across all populations, but you don't want the same medicine to be given to everybody. So you want the personalization there. And finally, you want to build trust. You want to explain the models uh, to the human. But the thing is, this is purely data driven. So you want to add knowledge on top of it. And so that's the second step, where the human is going to be more than a mere enabler. If I, if I have my uh, OBGYN that I work with, um, or, or the cardiologist that I work with, and I'm going to say, does this person have this disease or not? Can you look at it and say? They're going to do that for five people, but they're not going to label 500 people. But what they have is decades of training and knowledge. So how can we effectively tap into their knowledge and put it into a learning system? And finally, um, you know, I, I always give this example. Uh, during COVID, my, my, uh, my kid and I bonded very well. He's now eight years old. So during COVID, we, he was around four, we started building Legos. And I told him, you know, bring this Lego. And I, I used to show him how to build and stuff. Around the fifth year, I said, come on, Pranav, let's sit down and build today. And he turns to me and he says, shh, no. I said, what? I'm going to build. You help me when I need a help. And that's when it's like, it was like a, you know, lightning moment for me because, aha, you know why? He knows what he knows. And he, knows he does not know and ask that appropriate question rather than hallucinate. You see what I'm saying? Um, there, so the point is that the system should be able to know what it knows and explain what it does not know, okay? So what I'm going to do is kind of give you a good example of where I started. This was back in 2008. I started uh, working with David Page and he introduced me to this beautiful problem. Um, he saw that I was you know, in Wisconsin, uh, single, and you know, I had a lot of time. So he said, you know, in addition to this DAPA grant, you should do this extra thing. And so we started working on this. It's a beautiful uh, problem. In so in 1998 and 1999, there were a bunch of drugs approved in the US called COX-2 inhibitors. So these were like painkiller drugs that were prescribed for uh, muscle injuries. For if you have a dental surgery, you went for a root canal, they give you that uh, for, for, you know, to, to mitigate the pain. 
And then, but people started knowing weird things about it. So around in 2001, actually, next to Tylenol, these were the second most sold drugs in the US. Okay. And then in 2002, they started a study. And in 2004, they said, oh, whoa, heart attacks are a side effect of this. So we need to pull this from the market. And then, you know, you know how companies work. They want to keep their profits up. So they kept it again until for one more year or sorry, nine more months until the FDA actually said, this is the last day you should have it on the market. So till then, the drugs were sold. So what we did was we simply looked at data between 1998 and 2001. We ignored all the other data. We looked at data. We did machine learning in reverse. Um, again, I'll tell you the details if you want. Basically, uh, employing Bayesian base rule in inverse. And we came up with a bunch of rules to predict uh, this. And turns out that, um, you know, we, we had, a, if you look at uh, the first 10 rules, the rules between two and, say, seven are all the reasons why the drug was given. Okay, orthopedic aftercare, or like a dental surgery, injury to the chest wall, oral cavity. You see, these are the reasons why it was given. And then you see myocardial infarction or heart attack as one of the 10 predictors of this drug. So if I'm predicting who's on the drug, if they had a heart attack, they're very highly supposed to have the drug. And this is awesome because in the first 10, this was a side effect that dropped up. When you look up on the way into the top, it basically says, abnormal glucose level. And I'm talking excess of 400. So the, the opinion then was, maybe what happened was that this drug increased the glucose level beyond a certain extent that it caused a heart attack. We can't verify that because that requires killing more people. So we can't do that. But the fact is that people got excited. FDA got excited. And, and we actually got a big R01 out of this because of that finding. The fact that we just ran the data, simple data, to find out what was the side effect. And it was a simple linear algorithm, nothing fancy. And we were able to pick this out of the data. So that made me convinced that there is a lot of potential for machine learning in healthcare, okay? So I will take no more than 30 minutes. So what I'll do is, in, I'm gonna spend 10 minutes on each of these um, problems that I uh, explained. But before that, are there any questions? Yeah. So what are the steps that you're what? You don't learn only from data. Mm -hmm. But a lot of healthcare data has a lot of biases in it. Mm -hmm. so is, is there any way to account for that? Yes, that's that's, that's a great question. So when learning only from data, we have started to look at bias as as uh, as an important factor during mm -hmm. learning. But that's where knowledge comes in, in my opinion. If you have the knowledge of the bias, there is always ways of encoding the knowledge very effectively into the learning system, and then you can use that uh, knowledge as either constraints in this case of bias. Um, to do uh, uh, to do an effective, more effective learning. So yes, clinical data also has bias, quite a bit of bias. But the data itself is not actually a bias. But things like treatments are biased. There are there is enough treat. The, there was this thing that I looked at where maybe in one hospital the, the particular uh, uh, race had a higher chance of an invasive treatment when compared to another. But that's what you aim for. That's not the original data bias. But yes, bias is there, and bias has to be incorporated. Uh, the shields for bias have to be incorporated as knowledge. Right? I think I saw another hand here. Yeah. In the previous slide, um, you told the uh, rules, yeah. the predictors. Right? Yeah. Uh, so how? My, my question is because I now am working more in healthcare. Right? So uh, say mental healthcare, some gamer gets angry and shouts things that may make him seem unsafe. So then, uh, how do you get the doctor to take this seriously as some not spurious correlation? I see p-values, but is there some? No, we had more more things. P-values are what I'm showing here, mm -hmm. but basically this also shows that in the data it covers 202 12 positive examples. So we had only about uh, I think no more than 410 or 420 patients, mm -hmm. uh, 410 maybe. So out of which 50 percent of the patients demonstrated this as a side effect. Okay. So we, we had to do more quant, uh, qualitative uh, analysis on that to show that. I mean, again, the, it's a 2012 AAAI paper that you can uh, read, but but that's where we started. So yes, I agree with you. How, how can you get the doctors to show? Because you show this result, they see that these are all the causes for which it's given. Mm -hmm. And they were, we, but this popped out as a side effect. And that, that gets it interesting. So that's what I think we, we can do. See, the difference is the doctors can read this and make sense of this, even though they may not have sense of these, mm -hmm. they have sense of this very well. And, and then, so if they think of it as explainable, if then it's rules. Okay. 
So that's that's what we did, and we got them coming. So yes, to to answer your question, build an explainable model. They'll be very happy to see that. Actually, they are very good at looking at Bayesian networks. So if you build a Bayesian network, they're very happy to see that. There's a tendency to interpret that as a causal model. So you got you are the one who has to stay there and say no no no, it just explains a correlation, not a causation. But but that's our job. Yeah. Sir, in your project for predicting uh, pregnancy outcomes, so in a traditional setting, probably you would do an advanced uh, level one or level two scan to sort of get a diagnosis about the fetal state, right? So I just want to understand, like, is data driven method compared to the traditional diagnosis? Ask me this when I start that section, okay? okay? Because I'm going to have that exact same thing uh, as a second uh, part, and I'm very happy to explain that. Just ask, ask me at that mm -hmm. point. Yes. Data set in your oh, for all all the time we have that. Like, how does clinicians react on that? Clinician, I mean, the most of the data in real world is unbalanced. Most people are not married to each other. Most people don't even like each other. Most people are not friends to each other. Most people don't even know each other. So everything in the world is unbalanced. Okay, most of the data sets are artificial. They create that. They create a two is to one balance. In fact, you look at clinical studies. They have, um, they have a. Uh, what they call as case versus control, and the control is typically uh, uh, created by fixing on one matching. So I age match to control, race match to control, gender match. To con they have this control group that they create by by fixing on one value. That's not always correct. I mean, there is a beautiful paper in two thousand eight. The title of the paper is "Why Most Research Findings Are False." Okay, and that talked dwell deep, dwell deep into why these uh, uh, you know these studies should be taken with a a uh, pinch of salt. But it goes back to actually the morning proposal defense that we had. Uh, you have to understand what you're maximizing in this class imbalance. There is precision, there is recall, and you have to understand which one you are maximizing it. Why is one more important than the other? Uh, false positives versus false negatives, which has more cost, which has less cost. So there is really, which is one of the reasons I don't report accuracies at all on any of these, because accuracies are a hogwash for all these problems. You want to look at a more deeper metrics. Some papers just report F1, but again, that F1 is giving equal importance to both precision and recall. That's always not correct. Because if I look at uh, COVID or if I look at Ebola, I want to maximize recall. I want to minimize the number of uh, false negatives that go out in the world at the cost of quarantining a few extra false positives. So you have to understand that I agree with you. It's an important problem. And, and if you want, I can talk to you about how we do it. Uh, it's essentially inside the objective function. I think I have a quick thing. I'll, I'll show that, flash that as well. So here, I wanted to introduce this gradient boosting as a method of doing this. It's a very simple method. You can uh, think of it like, you know, you start with an initial model. You, you have your data. You make predictions on the data. You compute the gradients and then fit a new model to those gradients, okay? So for instance, uh, the simplest way is, let's say I'm predicting who has diabetes and who doesn't. So Sridham has diabetes. Kaujik is young. He doesn't have diabetes. So I'm, my label should be one, his label should be zero. If my current model predicts that I have diabetes with 0.83 probability, then my uh, gradient is going to be one minus 0.83, which is 0.17. For Kaushik, if it predicts that he has a diabetes with 0.24 probability, his label is zero. Zero minus 0.24 is negative 0.24. That is his weight. So all positive examples get put towards as one, and all negative examples get towards put zero, and, and it keeps going in a very simplest case. So whenever I'm fitting a new gradient, I'm going to have, I'm not going to treat me as a positive example and him as a negative example. And instead, we go for 0.17 for me and negative 0.24 for him. And we'll keep continuing until convergence. Okay, so that's the essence of this algorithm. It's beautiful. It's uh, uh, It was introduced by uh, Jerome Friedman in 2001. Um, and uh, he showed that this, this can be any regression function. And, more, and most people use trees because they're easy to interpret um, and uh, they can be understood uh, reasonably. Turns out that it's a very robust learning method. And in our lab itself, we have worked with multiple types of distributions, all the way from Poisson to Gaussians to uh, uh, exponential distribution. And exponential distribution has a beautiful property that it is convex, so it, it converges beautifully. And we have learned multiple models, uh, boring. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. We have applied it on, deployed it on several problems, including IBM standard in recognition at one point. Um, was we were uh, pushing this uh, in 2012 uh, into IBM's handwriting recognition uh, as well. So we've, we've done this on all these uh, different types of problems, but I want to just focus on uh, the problem that I just talked about, which is this uh, heart attack data set, right? And why does myocardial infarction happen? One of the key reasons is what is called as coronary artery calcification. You have this, um, the left coronary artery, and then you see the plaque, you see that uh, small 
uh, white thing here, that is the calcium deposit. As, as this keeps increasing, the vessel gets blocked, the fl blood flow stops, we will develop heart attacks. Okay? So one of the simplest things that we were asking, and I'm giving you slightly older results, um, because the newer results have not been approved yet, so I can't show them. Um, but the older results, uh, of course, we got the best performance, right? It's got to be the green, otherwise I'm not going to waste your time, my time, nobody's time. Right? But that's, again, the boring uh, number performance. But you see this tree, it makes a lot of sense, okay? So again, uh, this is in predicate logic notation, so it may not be that easy to understand, but let me uh, just walk you through a couple of branches, right? So this is basically checking if the person is a male, and uh, was actually in 1992 itself was on the older side of the population. So in 1992, this is the last year, this is the year of study. And so zero means 1985, so seven means 1992. In 1992, this was an older person who actually had a very high cholesterol back in 1992 itself and was smoking, had a 97% chance of a, uh, a coronary artery calcification as of women who did not smoke in, in 1980. So sorry, 99. So basically, we know very well that men are more prone to heart attack than women. That's that's known. The top predictor for heart attack is the gender. But the thing is, heart attack is much more lethal in women than in men. So there are many, There I know of at least one patient who has survived seven heart attacks, a male. But women rarely survive more than two heart attacks. So that's that's how lethal it can be. So uh, it's it's a very, uh, you know, unfair uh, game. But but uh, that's that's the way the priors are done in our life. And the thing that I thought was more interesting for me was when I when I just look at data from 1985 to predict in 2010, 1992 to predict in 2010, and so on, there was not that much improvement. We actually got very good prediction just from uh, 1985 data. And, and as you keep increasing, we, it kind of flattened out. It didn't help much adding newer data. So that tells me that people in that population at least were, you know, once a slob, always a slob kind of story. They didn't quite change their behaviors. They didn't quite take control of their health. It's not uh, unexpected in rural areas in particular. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, uh, one of the nice things about cardiology is that many things can be done outside the uh, clinic. Particularly, we can take control of our heart health with our behavior. And this is something that uh, clearly shows, right? So this is, again, this is saying somebody is currently attending school, which is in, in 19, uh, no, in, in the year 2000, they did not have a job. So this is a person in their mid uh, uh, 30s to their uh, mid 40s okay doesn't have a job continuously smokes um doesn't have a house in this data set it means they live with parents so this is a set of people who don't have a job who smoke who live with parents and had children so you can imagine no job no house having kids and smokes against somebody who doesn't smoke has been married for 10 years. Okay, I, I always want to say that they have been happily married for 10 years, but no, just married for 10 years. So which means they are in a stable relationship. They have a nine times lower chance than the other case, uh, which is uh, this case. So don't ask me, does it mean marriage is less stressful? No, clearly not. But but there's a whole other things going on here. Maybe the stability of the relationship helps. So we always check this. We always check this and we always see that married people in stable marriages seem to have lower things, at least in this 5,000 data set. We are verifying that in another data set called Jackson Heart Study. Amazingly, that also popped out there. So I don't know, maybe it's a Western culture thing. I don't know what the deal is, yeah, but it is clear that, you know, uh, but that is not, I'm saying all of you go get married. I'm not saying that too, okay? <clears throat> because I got my diabetes after marriage. So, um, <laughs> all right, I was diagnosed with diabetes after marriage. So that's the right thing. We also started building, uh, you know, uh, temporal models where we can figure out how things change over time so we can allow for interventions by doctors. Okay, so we were building these temporal models. Of course, we cannot change the number of children. We cannot say, go have more children or, you know, have less children. We have three, reduce it to two, right? So we can't do all those things. So, but understand that it's just to understand how these uh, things evolve over time. Some of these can allow for interventions. Some of these don't. Um, I'm going to quickly skip this, but we also have a a uh, device that we built with a company where we are putting this on uh, senior uh, citizens and trying to understand their exercise uh, activity and figure out you know how it helps in their cognitive development and also in their heart at the same time so anyway i'm i'm skipping that but all this is available in our uh, um uh, starling website you should be able to download and run it we have a bunch of um, support also that we provide continuously any questions on those before i move on to the next one
Yes. Uh, just to confirm the model that you used was something similar to a decision tree? Yeah, it's a gradient boosted model. Yeah. Oh, gradient boosted. And after 10 years, after 10 years of pleading with every PhD student of mine, figure out a way how to combine these gradients. Because I always say they're interpretable and people are like, come on, boosting is not interpretable, right? It's fair. It's a correct point. So I was basically figuring out how to combine these trees to get a single tree. So after 10 years, we have finally published the paper in Machine Learning Journal last year. Luckily, it was just went without any, no corrections required kind of a paper that I'm very proud of. So now we can actually take these 20 trees and construct a single decision tree. To, to arbitrary level of approximation that you can actually answer. And, and we can guarantee that you can't learn a tree that is better than the one that we have merged. So we have the theory finally out there. So, um, and so, yeah, now we have interpretable trees as well. Uh, explanations of tree ensembles, by like, I think compression. So I've given you all the keywords, tree ensembles, uh, explanations and compression. Okay, so compression is what we do. We show that actually you can compress even bagging based on this. All you need is a function. So in boosting, it's an additive function, but you could have a multiplicative function. You could have any function. As long as you can apply a function to, to an ensemble method, we can compress that into a single tree. That's what we show. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned intervention in the previous slide. Yes. So clearly, you assume that some of those models are causal, you know, you caution yes. yes. over interpreting with yeah. the methods In the next one, I'll show you those causal models as well. Yes. And how do you decide if they are causal? They are... Domain expert. Yes. We work with the domain expert, and that's why experts become important. Mm -hmm. We build these causal models, and then we verify them using measures of causality. You know, what if we remove this, adding some counterfactual, and stuff like that, we verify them. Yeah. So, but domain experts are important. We work with doctors. And every every application here involves at least one doctor. Uh, we yeah. also use some uh, textbook knowledge, background knowledge uh, to... That's a good question. We be just publishing, a, submitting a paper to AI in medicine, where we are using LLMs to generate this background knowledge. And then we show that, you know, it's not perfect. Um, and here is the expert knowledge, here is the LLM knowledge. Now, if I use this, what causal model I'm getting? When I use the expert knowledge, what causal model I'm getting? How the edges are different? So they are reasonable, the, the LLM knowledge, but they are not as good as the expert knowledge that you get okay, to, to measure causality. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question. Thank you. So we talked about knowledge. So maybe that's the time to bring in uh, this particular slide. So what are this type of knowledge that we talk about, right? In clinical practice, it's more like as A increases, B increases. As the uh, blood sugar level increases, the risk of heart attack increases. Higher blood sugar with higher BMI, uh, has a higher risk of heart attack than with lower BMI. So now we are basically talking about the influence of one uh, variable on another or two to three variables on, on the final ta target and so on. So these are called by, you know, Benjamin Kuipers uh, uh, has a wonderful book from 1985 called Reasoning Under uh, Qualitative Reasoning. And uh, there's an extension of that that says qualitative reasoning under uncertainty. And essentially these knowledge are qualitative knowledge that you can get from data. The second one is the precision versus recall trade-off. I just told you about uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the Ebola example, right? You don't want to. So, what is the worst case when you have a false positive? This person is going to be quarantined. Okay. In the case of US, they will sue you. It's US, so they have to sue you, and you will pay end up paying probably a millions of dollars. But you let them out, it's going to cost you billions of dollars. Now, for the, our current Congress, you explain in terms of dollars, they understand everything. So, it's very clear that you want to minimize uh, false positives at the cost of some, sorry, you want to minimize false negatives at the cost of some false positives. At the other end of spectrum, we are again talking about it in the morning, LinkedIn, right? I get all these recommendations from LinkedIn and every time I get this thing that says, uh, postdoctoral position is open, you should apply. And the two things, right? First is I've been a postdoc 15 years back and I've done my time, I'm done, I don't want to do it again. But the second more important thing is, it's the, I'm the PA of the grant for which it wants me to be a postdoc. Um, I'm one of the PAs of that grant. So the point I'm trying to make is that why? Because it, it's also trying to re, uh, optimize recall in some sense, trying to get everything that is relevant. Whereas it should be thinking about what is the top five that I present to him that is most relevant. So in recommendation systems, you want to maximize precision. In uh, other systems uh, like uh, uh, healthcare, you want to maximize recall. And you want to understand that, that it's not a zero one uh, uh, problem here, it's a spectrum. And we have to understand where we need it, where we need this to be on the spectrum and you need to be able to uh, tune it in a different way. And the other one is preferences. 
Again, there are, and doctors are classic examples. There are some doctors who are very aggressive in their treatments, and there are some doctors who are very, you know, passive. They want to give it time, let your body recover. And each of them have their preferences on how they do it. Once I got, you know, I got a fever in India. I had high fever for two days. I went to this doctor in India, and this guy just pulled, you know, medicines from his cabinet there. And it was, it was all, right, white color tablets with no labels. He just pulled, he'll put five. He'll put five and, and he had this thing and then he put everything together and he said, take six of each. So I had six of each for two days. My fever went away. I had one week of diarrhea. <laughs> but my fever went away. It probably killed everything in my digestive system. But point I'm trying to make is he aggressively brought something down. Uh, I had, uh, I had, uh, you know, my, 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 I had flu, I think four years back or five years back. My doctor says, let's not go for all these anti-flu medicines. Let your body fight. You take this Tylenol once a day. That to avoid taking it if your temperature is under 100 and not. So you see the difference, right? It's their preferences. Each of them have a preference. Each of them has a reason of why they are doing what they are doing. And we need to understand and integrate that into your learning system. The, the last type of uh, model that we, uh, sorry, advice, knowledge that we get, and this also happens more often than not, is some extra features during training that is not there during deployment. So as a classic example, if you work with any clinical study data, you'll see that now they have all these fancy uh, smart home things that they collect. They put the crazy sensors on you. They have these smartphones. They have the smart uh, speakers, smart cameras at home. They record everything. They have all the data, right? But when you go to the uh, actual deployment, right? say it's in an in a Alzheimer's kind of a problem, they only have your electronic health record data and some clinical test data. They don't have access to any of this. So when your learning model uses this, in a probabilistic graphical model sense, you have to marginalize out of this. Okay, in a, in a machine learning model, these become latent features that you have to work with. And that's not easy. So what do you want to do? You want to use this as constraints for learning. So the common theme among, among all of these is that you have them as constraints. And the way we do that, I kind of skip all the details, but I can tell you the simplest way to do that is to develop some sort of a objective function that takes the data and the, uh, the constraint, the knowledge, and trades off between them. We show one such approach in our 2020 paper, but we have a bunch of papers, including a recent uh, Frontiers in AI paper, where we have multiple different ways of doing these constraints. Essentially, these constraints would just uh, be added upon the data, and then, of course, uh, you get much better results, particularly in, in low uh, complexity, uh, sorry, low samples uh, cases. You have very good uh, results, and, and I think that is the goal of these methods in any what, way. What is Gerloff and Ljubljana? Uh, those are the two simple uh, regression data sets from uh, this thing, uh, UCI. There's the other data that, that's there in the paper, but it's not a curve, it's in tables form. So we have uh, regression data from a tracking company that we uh, did and, and some other clinical work. Yeah, it's a loan prediction cool. data set, yeah. And then, of course, we have done this in context of several of these problems. So I'm going to skip all that, but I'm going to talk about this clinical study, like you just said, right? We looked at these nulliparous women. We're looking at uh, uh, figure out who had gestational diabetes. It goes back to your point. It's vastly imbalanced. Most women did not have gestational diabetes, but it's important that we identify the 4% of the women and minimize their chances of having a preterm birth, right? So it's important to do all of this. So we have a whole bunch of things that we measured. And uh, we were uh, uh, one of the newest. Uh, uh, newest uh, contributions of our uh, grant this year is that we developed the polygenic risk score, which is basically saying, before I know anything about you, uh, before I measure everything about you, rather, uh, I, can I tell you the prior probability of you having a diabetes, a gestational diabetes? And that is an extremely important measure. And so that, that is very useful for many of these problems. So to answer your question, what are we doing that is beyond what is already done? Imaging studies cannot tell you whether there is a chance of preterm birth or not. Imaging study, just looking at the first year of the first uh, scan of the baby, you cannot say whether the woman is going to have gestational diabetes or not. We cannot say whether preeclampsia or hypertension is going to be possible or not. So those are only looking at is the fetus healthy when it's development or has something happened to the fetus inside the body. It is not telling anything about how the pregnancy is going to progress and how things are going to come out. So what we are doing are exactly those questions. Can we identify right at the first scan and say, this woman has a higher risk of gestational diabetes. Most importantly, after childbirth, many women who are at the risk of gestational diabetes become normal, but some actually go on to have type 2 diabetes for the rest of their life. And can we avoid that? Some have high blood pressure, and actually a friend's wife would have nearly died because she had such a high uh, blood pressure. 
and the kid had to be taken out at 25 weeks and has a bunch of complications because of that. The point I'm trying to make is that we want to avoid all these situations as much as possible. Okay, so for instance, one of the things that we did was we used a causal uh, type model here, and it's it's called independence of causal influence, or uh, by back in 1993, a beautiful paper by Heckerman and Brees uh, in 1993 that talks about independence of causal influence. We we just developed the model where we considered each of these causes to be separate. So you have a polygenic risk code, um, you have the prior history, high blood pressure, uh, uh, age, and so on, and how much influence that they did. And then we, uh, sorry, how much exercise they did. And we were combining them using like a causal uh, mechanism, and we got some very, very good result, as predictive as a gradient boosted model, but something that is even more causal and that is much more explainable. And, and what we did was we also showed that if you use this kind of knowledge, you can actually learn more compact models. So this is the edge count of the models. Uh, how many edges are there in your Bayesian network? And this is how many parameters are there in your Bayesian network. We learn much more compact models for much better performance, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, the error rates and uh, uh, how, how well we did on these problems. But the most important thing is if you have a knowledge, you actually learn a more accurate model. So you're getting closer to the causal model. So for instance, all we said was this BMI, um, Increased BMI causes increased risk of gestational diabetes, increased PRS caused it, and so on. And here you see that th this is the model that just learned only on data. This is the model with knowledge, and it identified the polygenic risk score as the most important factor. The most important factor, actually, in any diabetes, whether it's gestational or not, is the prior risk of diabetes. Does your family history, does it contribute? How much of your family history has that? And that comes out using this PRS score. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a much more closer model to what a human already knows. This is a model that works well, but one where you should be like, I don't care why it works, but it works. Okay, this on the other hand, is a model that you can take it to the human and say, is this causal? And the answer is almost yes, because there is one link here that we don't understand, particularly why does, uh, actually, where is it? Oh, we don't have it here. We, I, I, I marked it out. But high blood pressure causing something like exercise. There was some mistake there that we are still figuring out why it happened. Everything else seems to be perfectly causal in terms of why it happened. And we were doing the reverse. Can we actually learn these kinds of rules by learning like a probabilistic graph of the model? So all we did was uh, we took the data, we learned a causal network uh, using the famous PC algorithm. Um, and then once you have a PC algorithm, uh, once you have the uh, uh, causal graph, we developed a method that looked at conditional probability distribution to figure out these relations. As BMI increases, risk of heart attack, sorry, risk of gestational diabetes increases. As uh, uh, exercise decreases, risk of gestational diabetes increases, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we've done that. I'm going to skip this. This is called a probabilistic circuit. It's a big thing right now in, in, AI, uh, in the UAI uncertainty in AI community. And we have, uh, but these are deep probabilistic models. And again, we have uh, tried to explain uh, these as a, uh, to generate explanations from this. And so for instance, um, we basically said BMI is independent of age, ra race, and education uh, if you don't have gestational diabetes. If, you have, if, you, if, the person, if the woman doesn't have gestational diabetes, then these are called context-specific independencies inside uh, AI. And they are extremely, extremely intuitive to understand once you understand how they work, okay? So uh, we were able to explain this that says, if the woman does not have, uh, 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 gestational diabetes, that BMI has really no effect on any of this. On the other hand, when the woman has gestational diabetes, then BMI actually has effect on all of these things. So you, you understand these and then you can start again, going back to your question, you can develop interventions based on this kind of uh, uh, domain knowledge that we have developed. Okay, and I'm going to move on. And again, right, uh, there is this beautiful paper in JAMA Network for Open that uh, Kim uh, from Northeastern where I'm part of this grant, as I said, there are three uh, PIs, one from Northeast and one uh, is, uh, from uh, Regan Street, and I am the PI from UT Dallas, so three of us work. We looked at uh, understanding the genetic predisposition and physical activity, and uh, we actually came up with the hypothesis and figured out how physical activity uh, exercise, uh, in particular exercises, uh, reduces the risk of gestational diabetes. But there's a catch. There's always a catch. The catch is that if a woman decides that she is going to be pregnant, I always suggest start your exercises. Start it before you get pregnant, not after you get pregnant. Because after it gets pregnant, the age-old wisdom of don't exert yourself is still true. So women who don't 
exercise before, but suddenly starts yoga, cycling, and I know somebody who did that, has a good chance of preterm birth. And, and, and this is something that we have to be aware as a community that, you know, you start early your, your exercises. The same reasons why they tell you to take your prenatal vitamins before you even start uh, planning your pregnancy. So that's the, that's the way it has to go. And we, we were able to show the value of this in, in this uh, data set. Yes. Intense models out of your quality model. Yeah. So, uh, were you able to learn all the intense? Like no, no, no. No, we can't learn everything. I, I'm, I'm very uh, confident of that. We can learn some, and some that we can learn are we are confident we can put it in practice. So, I, I don't think we can learn everything, but we are still, and we got only a three-year grant. We are filing the extension for that. So, we want to really understand how each influences each other. So gestational diabetes, how does it increase preterm birth? How does gestational diabetes increase hypertension and so on? So we are trying to look at it rather holistically. So maybe in the next two to three years, we will, I will have an answer. If I come back within three years, when I give a talk, I will hopefully answer that we have done connected these dots as well together. Actually, one of the most exciting things that I did not talk about was we also went from pregnancy outcomes to children health. So we have no pediatric health. We have actually published a paper where we are uh, predicting when a kid is admitted to the hospital, uh, we can predict up to 17 hours early if this kid is going to have a heart attack in the hospital. And that is a tool that they are trying to employ in UT Southwestern. They're going to try and deploy this tool and see if they can use it for real-time prediction of when a heart attack could happen so we can mitigate that in children. So we're going from you know, pregnant uh, maternal health to neonatal health and, and pediatric health as well. So I think I have... I want to stop in two minutes. So I'm going to just quickly uh, run through this. Uh, actually, you know what? I just have the results here. So we were uh, trying to predict it up from 17 hours. I mean, I'm showing results from 13 hours. And this just got published in, two, uh, in a journal, as in a cardiology journal. And here, again, we were learning this type of booster trees and combining the trees to uh, come up with. Why do I like this type of trees? Because you can turn them into an if-then-else rules. So every path you can say, if this sequence happens, this is the probability. Uh, else, if this sequence happens, this is the probability. So you can write this out as an uh, in classic, again, machine learning. And, and yeah, of course, in data structures, you call them as decisionless. So you can write these out as decisionless, and people can understand decisionless better. Of course, there is, I'm just saying better, because if I have a tree of depth 27, it's not, it's as opaque as a deep neural network, as a transformer. So, I mean, to a certain extent, this is all uh, fine, OK? So we are uh, doing this. And again, we have done some work. And we have looked at cardiology um, data. We are looking at multiple procedures, figuring out who is going to have uh, angioplasty, who needs a valve replacement, and who has EKG as a bunch of other uh, factors. So we were learning this joint causal models uh, as well. And we did some uh, discriminative learning on electronic health records. I'm, I'm focusing less on electronic health records because of the simple fact that you know, the, many people are working on electronic health records. So I just wanted to motivate the more interesting problems in my head. But again, if you get hold of an electronic health record, always work with it. Okay, it's very, very difficult to get hold of one. But if it does, I think it's a wonderful record to work with. Uh, you will realize once you start working on uh, healthcare data, many, many, many assumptions that we make in machine learning are not true. The, the IID assumption first breaks. Before you even think about it, IID breaks. Because the second visit to a particular doctor is not independent of the first visit. It's very simple. Okay, so ID assumption breaks, and then a whole bunch of other assumptions that have millions of data points booked out of the window very quickly. Okay, so, and like you just said, class imbalance, you have to live with it. That's your thing. And you have to figure out why you are robust um, as well. So again, I'm just saying one, uh, uh, no ring uh, to rule them all. So you have to be very carefully select uh, your uh, algorithms. It's okay if you have shallow algorithms, as long as your reasoning is deep. Okay, if you have a good causal uh, explanation, I think that's more sufficient. They are more elegant, they're beautiful, and people can understand them, and most importantly, can intervene on them, okay? Um, and then human as an ally in learning, and we should be able to efficiently use the human knowledge and input. And of course, once again, you think about communication as one of the uh, most important attributes. Communication is a very, very, very big problem in current world. I'll just give you this one tidbit. When I joined Indiana University in about 2015, I spoke with a high-performance computing person on how we scale up these algorithms. And this person, she looked at me and she said, Sriram, give me an algorithm. I said, you know, I have belief propagation. I have this, uh, you probably know this, this counting belief propagation, which is this passing of messages and clustering symmetry-aware belief propagation. And she goes, no, no, no. 
that's an application. I, I, I want an algorithm. I said, what do you mean? Belief propagation is an algorithm. Then the, the application is natural language processing documents, but that's why we were running. That was our DARPA brand back in the day. And then she said, no, what you're telling me is an application. And that's when I realized this for this high performance computing person, scheduling is an algorithm. Whereas machine learning algorithms are applications. Now, what I'm trying to suggest is this is between two computer science faculty who probably took each other's course at some point. She probably had AI and machine learning. I probably had uh, systems courses, and yet we could not communicate on the right language. So when you communicate with domain experts, always first establish your vocabulary, understand what you're talking, and then you talk. So take time in understanding their problem. That's my point. Okay, you don't have to go deep, but understand their problem. Uh, it's a long way to go, miles to go before you know we uh, we stop. Um, deployment, something that we are looking at in uh, many, many, many problems. There is a recent grant uh, that is actually expiring called Data Science Genome, where I want to build this, uh, you know, uh, web page for machine learning people. So a new grad student comes and says, I want to learn about machine learning or deep learning. And then show me the papers. We do not want it to start from 2013 because the algorithms are from 1980s, many of these algorithms. So we want to go back and give everything and say, what is more recent? Why you want to read the more recent paper? Oh, yeah, they more valuable. So that's kind of things. The thing that I'm really passionate about right now is learning from multiple experts. Again, multiple doctors. Um, safety, ethical, fairness constraints are important. Now, in days, multimodal learning is extremely important. And of course, you want to uh, teach the human back at some point. So with that, I'm done. So thank you. And ask me any questions. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great question. So we answer, we ran multiple algorithms actually, and all of them gave me similar results on that data set. So that told me that 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 causal discovery algorithms were reasonable, um, and pretty much all of them had the same set of edges. They may be reverse here and there, but but overall the set of rules that we got out of them were the same. We chose PZ because it's the simplest. And the idea was that can be, the goal is not learn causality, but the goal, goal is to understand these constraints. As A increases, B increases. Can you get that from data? So that was what we go for. I am asking because uh, there are other algorithms like uh, MCMC, AI. Sure. For sure design. But see, MCMC is still not a good causal model in my opinion. It's a sampling. It seems to work well on some problems, not all the time. Uh, PCs, on the other hand, you can input causal constraints and you can learn the causal model better. So some are better causal model learning than the other. And I think PC is one of the better ones, even now. It's, it's 30 years old, but it's still one of the better ones, in my opinion. Some are really robust. And if you're really interested in this direction, I particularly refer to this uh, Professor Peter Spirits from CMU. They have done a lot of work, even more recently, on using this for medicine. And that's a lot of interesting work in that direction. Yes. So coming back to my question on meaning. Oh, I thought I answered it, but no. Yeah, that's you cool. answered okay. it. Okay, <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding, go. But uh, like in using physical scans, as long as I'm aware, uh, we also use a similar approach where they have statistics and they match their diagnosis with the statistics. For example, they will say, this is safe, perfect. It has a 90% risk of a down syndrome. Yeah. So how can- But you know when that is done? That's what? not done in the first visit. I think it's a level two scan. It's in the twentieth week, right? But before that, they would have just developed gestational diabetes because gestational diabetes can develop as early as ninth week. Yes, and that can increase the chances of even Down syndrome and other things. Right. So what we are trying to do is actually have it at the time that I know that the woman is pregnant. Right. Can I start predicting things? So we are looking at much earlier than than twentieth week. All the data that I have here are from the first visit, which is maximum fifth week. They don't go beyond that. Right. So uh, after five weeks, we typically get an appointment. Yeah. So so that's what we are looking at. You're, the thing is, right, we have some understandings of some diseases. Right. Particularly Down syndrome is one. Let's give you an example. Right. There are some other cases that they can say, um, like the woman in Texas who just went through this, if she goes through pregnancy, um, the chance of the, uh, the, the uh, uh, kid dying is very high, but the chance of the mother dying is also very high. You can compute that for certain conditions, but not as a general rule for everyone not out of other things, because they don't really look at hypertension as a big deal. But that's a life-altering thing for the women, because she'll be on lifelong medications. If she gets pregnant at 65, for four, sorry, 25, and she's alive till 65, for 40 years, 
she has to be on blood pressure reducing medications. Yeah. And that's not always a good idea. So we are trying to figure out how can we mitigate these things early enough to all of these interventions. Sir, also, uh, given that you are finding certain instances, for example, for the like this leads to that. However, the in current diagnostic setup, they are available or only limited set of that has been converted, let's say, for 19 Monday. So how can the instances that we are getting from here be given to doctors so that probably what the diagnostic level two can they can do at level one? So it's not about level two or level one. You're only still focusing on the structure of the baby. Yes. That's what a scan tells you. A scan doesn't tell you anything anymore. It just gives me the structure of the baby. And they're looking at that structure to make predictions. Right. These are done by blood tests, urine tests, uh, and you know other uh, measurements, other sensor readings. Right. So it's, it's not that I cannot use the blood scan. We also have the scans. We have not figured out how to use the scan. The scan is only predictive of the preterm birth of the baby. Yes. That is the best we can predict. We cannot predict other things like the... What affects the mother? We are not able to predict that very well with these scans. Only times we can do that is if we find this particular genetic disorder through that scan. Then we know that, okay, the, the, this, this person is in the high risk of this. So scans can do so much, but not everything. Yes. And we are not, look, if we can solve that problem, why are we having 17% adverse outcomes? Because we have not solved that. That's why I think we still should be doing these things. So isn't it the responsibility of the Dynac to how do you correlate when you don't know whether it exists or not? Uh, okay. Whatever guys. they do will be a mistake at that point. Uh, we're going to take this uh, offline. Yeah, sorry, uh, this is fantastic. Uh, no, they, she can ask, but yeah. I think yeah, no, no, uh, if, no, if, the, ask. if the class students need to leave, they, yeah. they can leave. And uh, yeah, if there's any class students who is you know, yeah. uh, not attending in That's person exactly and has not already made prior are, arrangement, then please uh, talk to me. I'm banning in genomics, proteomics, and uh, sequence data. So that's done by uh, Rafael Navarro at uh, not uh, 